All right. All right. Uh, recording has begun. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is the final application workshop for the SDG Homelessness Prevention Services funding. Um, this is the workshop where we're going to go over the budget portion of the application. Um, if you guys have questions at any point, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, you can also uh, put questions in the chat, but we will probably be more likely um, to answer your question if you unmute and ask the question. Um, Oh, that didn't work. Okay. All right, I might do this a couple times just <laughs> to make this easier on myself. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that I'm here um, with two of my coworkers. Uh, my name is Natasha Doye. My pronouns are she, her. I'm in the Office of Community and Homeless Services at Snohomish County. Human Services Department, um, and I'm going to be working on this grant funding. I have my colleague, G here. Um, G, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is G, and I'm also with the Office of Community Homeless Services, and I will also be part of the SDG Prevention Grant. And then Sam. Hi, good afternoon. Sam Scarbell, Supervisor for the Office of Community and Homeless Services. Thank you for being here. It worked, okay. Um, I'm so happy that G and Sam are here because with the questions that I know everyone's gonna have, I am certain that we will have some pretty good answers for you. Um, if there's anything that we can't answer during this um, application workshop, then we will definitely get back to you. Um, today on the agenda, the biggest part is that we're gonna go over the budget workbook um, and then if we have time, we'll answer additional questions you may have on the narrative portion of the application and also go over some important things um, to know about the application and the timeline. Um, but we're really here to answer questions for you. So please let us know if you have any questions. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to point out was that the budget workbook instructions are Appendix B of the RFP. So if you go to the RFP and you go to the very, very end, it's the last two pages. And um, those instructions kind of help walk you through the different tabs for the budget workbook. And they give you examples, um, which is really, really beneficial, especially for tab two, which is the narrative portion. Um, it gives you examples of ways that you can kind of explain and justify the different um, uh, costs that you have listed. Um, and so I think it's really beneficial to utilize that Appendix B as you work through the budget workbook. And then, okay, now I'm going to stop sharing. Um, actually, before I do that, um, some of you might remember in some of our previous application workshops that Debbie put together um, a funding example. And this is not a recommendation, it is just an example. Um, the example was that if, say, uh, four organizations were awarded funding um, and they were equally awarded the same amount, that would come out to $285,500. Um, and so what I did is I used this funding example to create an example workbook. So the budget workbook that I'm going to show you has these numbers in it just so that you can see what it would look like if it's if someone started to fill out the budget workbook. So this is just an example. It's not a recommendation. It's just an example. All right. So and I'm going to open up that example budget. Okay. So 
So now I just need to move it around so that you can see it all. Let me see if it will help if I do this. Did that expand it? Expanded it slightly. Okay. Um, so for this funding example, um, I used the same example that Debbie had given before, which was if you divide the 1,142,000 by four, um, then that comes up with your total amount. Um, the categories for this, this is um, the first tab. So we organize the categories into three sections. So we have the program operations and expenses. And then we also have um, administration. And then we have program client assistance. And for the client assistance, we separated it into like rent payments and other housing costs um, just to make it a little bit more simple um, for you to estimate uh, projected amounts. And then you'll see that if we go to tab two, and then scroll back up to the top, that um, the amounts already calculate, they move over from the first tab. So whatever you fill out in the first tab in your budget, that will automatically populate on the second tab. And this is the section where you would provide narrative explanations for the different categories and the different amounts. Um, and then just to show you the third tab, third tab is um, specifically salary and wages. And then with this one, um, something to keep in mind, and I believe that I made sure in the RFP that um, it was stated, is that this funding for this first year is going to be over 11 months, not 12 months. Um, it's going to, the contract is going to start August 1st instead of July 1st. And so um, there's a calculation uh, in the spreadsheet that automatically multiplies it by 11 to get the annual charge. And then one more thing I just wanted to point out that I didn't point out in the first tab um, was the column C. So column B is for um, grant requested funds. So this is for um, the SDG prevention, homelessness prevention funds. If you are running this program um, with additional funds from a different source, then column C is where you would include the, that other funding and that other source. And then um, if you follow it down, the other sources can be listed here. And there's additional places for funding period and amount. Okay, and then I'm going to open it up for questions right now. Uh, quick question I had was re related just to what you were looking at there. Oh, I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, is that, um, does that include in-kind dollars or just hard cash? What do you mean by in-kind in -kind dollars? If, I, if I'm providing a free office for the entire year for this project, does that count towards some um, program value? I, I, I have some of them that do and some of them that don't. I want to say yes <laughs> on that part. Okay. My, my tendency would be to say yes, because we generally put in kind into these things and just note them that way. But I, I was just curious if there was a preferred reporting method or if we're talking just you know physical cash that's coming from another program or potentially let the in kind sources that are contributing to the value of the program. Hey, uh, this is this is Sam, and um, I would imagine there's a dollar amount, right? So you can only really attach um, something with a dollar amount that you're adding up, and of course you you would be leveraging that room. Um, other resources aren't required for this contract, but it's good to put in here if you're leveraging whatever it might be, right? Again, the dollar value of that of that room, or if it's staff, uh, other staff time that are contributing something to it. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, I would list that. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Thank you. I 
Thank you. You've answered a question I was going to ask. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, it, it um, to be honest, I think mostly it strengthens your application if you have, have other costs that you can leverage with these dollars, right? If that makes sense, if you're able to attach some other things uh, to strengthen this program um, that would benefit your application, but it's not required. Also on the other resources item is that it gives a county an idea of how much it actually costs for you guys to operate this project. So this could cost X amount, let's say for $100,000, but the SDG could only cover maybe come to 80% where the other 20 is covered by other resource. But as a county, we would like to see what is actually costing you guys to operate this for 11 months. Just a question here, Momodu from Wawa. Just, um, hello. Hello. Yeah, I'm just trying to tie what you said to what um, Sam just said. So um, staff that are going to be contributing towards this project, you can also um, estimate their monetary contribution as other costs, correct? Yes. Did that go through? Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry. The answer was yes. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions about what um, is an eligible cost or eligible expenses for this funding? I didn't really have a lot of specific costs because most of it seems to be money that's going to, I mean, a lot of it, the bulk of it seems to be the idea to give it away to the client. So, I mean, you know, by the time you get through a little bit of staffing and some overhead, you're, I mean, honestly, I think most of us are going to be run out of money by the time we get to that point. Um, so I don't, I don't particularly have any concerns about it, but um, if there's any specifically excluded items, you know, like, um, you know, I mean, if we were going to have a little event and have some food, I would still probably pull the funding from somewhere else. And those are usually things that are excluded. But um, I'm, I'm guessing it's got pretty standard fare for excluding childcare and food and stipends, things like that. Give away, or well, actually we're giving away in this program, Never mind. Um, yeah, exactly. And those then, getting a little feedback. Um, would what you would put in as other resources is leveraging so yeah I, these funds i don't think could cover the costs of um like an event um but if if you're able to host that event still or planned one um i would list that under other resources so oh, like if, if we're if we're having you know let's just say we're having a big event and we're going to dedicate a booth space and staff to staffing it for this program at that event, that would just be some ancillaries that we put in other costs, the other cash or other other funding sources. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, an example would be, oh, go ahead, sorry. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you. Okay, okay, it's Ruby from Ruby's Place. Um, my question is, when you're um, allocating funds for an individual, is there a cap on how much you can actually do as far as paying deposits or rental amount for one client? There's no, Meaning, there's no dollar amount cap. However, okay. you guys um, need to think about in your project how many months that you want to assist a client because number of months will actually determine the amount for that client. If you can actually assist to each client, I agree with that one. Okay, that was. But there's question. no there's no dollar maximum amount allowed per part. Okay, got it. 
Yeah, and I think with the by and for specifically, we want to make sure that um, it's something that you think about and think about what is going to work best for your organization. We do recommend that um, it's a good idea to estimate, like take your total amount of um, uh, client support funds and divide that by 11, which is the number of months that you'll be um, doing this project if you're awarded the funding, and then use that as your, you know, estimated amount. Per month. Yeah. So it could, you know, be a couple hundred dollars either way, but if you stick with that budget, then that will help guide you as far as you can make decisions on if you want to help, you know, one client for multiple months, or if you want to help multiple clients for say one month or two months or, you know, arrears, um, we want to make sure that you are able to do what works best for your clients and your community. Um, but that's going to be part of like the contracting process is that you will estimate those amounts um, and, you know, we'll go back through the budget again and make sure that it's, you know, uh, realistic and achievable. Good evening. This is Pa. Hi, Pa. Hello. Hello. Um, this is Pa. Orders. Yeah. Sorry, I'm connecting from the Gambia in Africa and network is somewhat fluctuating. So I've got in and out a couple of times. My question is mostly, um, I would mostly be around the reporting um, for the funding. Uh, what are the expectations or what and what would we be expected to provide? Even an instance, if we are to help an undocumented fellow in the community or community member who lives with a family friend, um, that start asking them to pay for rent and they are not ready to sign or fill out a W-9. We don't have problems with apartment complexes and other landlords, but there are, for example, if somebody that has a two, three bedroom and gives out one of the room to a community member who stays with them, uh, who needs help to pay the rent and they don't have, the landlord is not willing or comfortable to fill out a W-9 form. I mean, just wondering. Yeah, the under uh, uh, what is... would be the requirement or alternative things that you, we understand that if we give if somebody is to we give anybody six hundred dollars or more or spend six hundred or more, we of course know the requirement to collect a W nine from them. But we've been running into that situations where landlords or um, people who host some of their family or friends or other community members are just not comfortable to give out a W nine. And of course, these are undocumented folks that cannot have apartments in their name in their own name because they don't have the basic documentation, which is a social security number and an ID card. Can you assist undocumented workers? So for the cases, for those cases, we will actually need two parts. One of them, like you said, will be W-9 part from the landlord because it is the, um, it is IRS law for the landlord yeah, that as an income. So that's where that comes in. The second part is we do see many cases where um, households or families are um, leasing or renting from a private home. So it's not an apartment complex, mm -hmm. but sometimes they're renting from mm -hmm. families. In that cases, they will need to somehow develop if they don't already have a legal lease. They need to have a documentation of a lease that shows this is the address they're staying, this is what they're renting and how much is per rent, how much is each month rent. We need to have some, the landlord and or the client family needs to provide that document because that document would guide the project how much the client owes the landlord. Well, that's where the problem comes in because oftentimes in our community, I mean, those people are even uh, like scared to provide any things, and we have witnessed situations where they in fact ended up sending these people out on the streets just because they have requested for assistance from us 
and we have asked them for a W-9. As you said, the W-9 is IRS. We are very familiar with it. But they don't provide some of these things, just a verbal consent. As long as they continue to pay or they are able to pay, the landlords would accept them in. And if they're not ready to pay, I mean, or if they are not in a position to pay, they just kick them out. The part with the W-9 is something that we can reach out to commerce. Because since this is commerce funding, that we can reach out to commerce for guidance. However, the other part is if a landlord is receiving any money from this project, so a household owes arrear, month or two of arrears, and we are paying that arrear check to the landlord, there is a form where the landlord needs to sign it. They're saying that I am getting, let's say, $2,000 for the month of February, and they need to acknowledge that they are receiving the money for on behalf of their tenant. And so that form is required for landlord because they are receiving a check and we need to have some kind of acknowledgement to say that they received the check. So that will be required by the two, I mean, from the landlord. Okay. On those cases, I know um, it, we, we probably need to discuss it, but case by case, we are seeing this in our community as well. And it, it's, Sometimes the landlord needs to understand what this project is about. It's not where this project is not about undocumenting and finding the documentation for it. it is eviction prevention. And once we can kind of explain that to landlords, they are more willing to participate because they are receiving money. They're getting checked for the months they they would they would not get the money for. So these are not, for the most part, these are not usually typical, I mean, landlords. These are people that um, somebody comes from, a community member comes, either they divorce with a family member or uh, with their husband or wife, or they have another um, uh, challenge and just needs a place to be. And they get hooked up with someone who can lodge them. And that's how it, it anyway, I guess yeah. we'll figure that our, our, our situations are usually deeper and more complex than um, uh, the conventional problems or housing challenges or problems. Yeah, however, yeah. the check needs to be made to someone, right? Because we're not paying it to cash. Check needs to be made to someone. And whoever the someone is receiving the check must acknowledge it. So that, that documentation process must take place. I see what you I see what you're saying, Pa, and I do see that as potentially problematic um, for the for those that you're working with. And I know that you know that's that's feedback we can take back to the state. Um, but those are some of the some of the guidelines around this funding. Um, I think that's really important for them to hear. It's not going to do much in terms of closing the, I mean, gap for us. I don't want to hijack the meeting with all these yeah. questions, but certainly it wouldn't take care of, not to say that um, some of our community members would not benefit, but those undocumented folks live with people who are just trying to help out to get them situated. And they also probably are fearing um, getting money from these people and how it would end up affecting them to be used as a public charge against them in the future. So even if they are to collect the money, they don't want to have that paper trail. So yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, keep keep bringing these up because that's this is the stuff we need to, you know, ultimately work through. I was going to say we we run into this a fair a fair amount working with the Latino community in the area. You know, is um, what I'm what I'm hearing is the goal is to tie the W nine piece to the landlord, who in theory should be reporting income. You know, if you're if is is that kind of that's kind of the gist of it. Is that correct? I mean, if you know if if somebody's doing it out of the goodness of their heart, obviously there's no documentation required. But when they start receiving money, it uh, it is kind of income, so um, yeah, I think there's going to be some weird cases in here, but generally, you know, same thing for the same type of people, you know, if we tied their, if they needed utility payments, we, you know, we did this before, we make the payment directly to the vendor, and then the paperwork responsibility really falls on the vendor at that point is, is kind of how we've tried to do some of it. 
least with our clients. Um, Andreas might know a little bit better. He's worked at, with the full rent assistance program. I'm not sure how they handled that, but um, you know, we're, we'll work with you through it. And Andreas, yeah, it's pretty I, similar. Sorry, go ahead, Sam. Oh, I, I was just going to repeat your question, but uh, go ahead and answer, and then you can ask your question that's in the chat. Yeah, um, like Tom alluded, uh, we face um, similar cases like that, where, but it's mostly with independent landlords that you know only own a house and uh, they're renting it out to whoever. Um, and there are some difficulties, especially because with the rent assistance that we were working on with Volunteers of America, um, we weren't even asking for a W-9. We were just asking for a tax ID number or a DUNS number. And even that by itself is difficult sometimes to get from landlords, especially independent ones who don't have a business or uh, employment like um, EIN or whatever. And um, oftentimes um, when they don't have that, we have to ask for their social security number. And that's when they're like, oh, wow, no, it's getting too personal. Like, um, luckily, um, we were able to uh, successfully service a lot of our clients, uh, most of them. Uh, but there were some that fell through the cracks because the landlords just did not want to cooperate. And also, luckily, there used to be an alternative uh, called the tenant payment assistation where we would pay um, the check, uh, the aid directly to the tenant. So that way the landlord doesn't have to um, be obligated to the clauses in the rent payment agreement. But um, that option um, was removed in 2023 uh, this year. So it had there is that barrier with independent landlords and just um landlords in general that don't want to provide that information and that is exactly my point that i was it's it's exactly the same situation i mean they as soon as it starts to be complicated if it's independent somebody that has two bedroom or three bedroom apartment and has one ex homelessness they just lodge them once it starts to get comes they would rather like kick them out than even collect the money from them because of the requirements so and until these barriers are removed um it makes it just a lot more complex and complicated Alternative would be us taking apartment units in the name of our, I mean, our organizations and then host them in there. Yeah, for those, these are unique cases. I do, we do understand it and we will raise it to state because this is state funding. So we are abide by the regulation. And the, um, again, the other option under SDG is relocation is allowable cost. So if they do, or if a household is in, and the landlord is not willing to willing to participate, the other option for the household is a relocation and this funding is allowed to assist them. Mm -hmm. So as my brother alluded to, is it possible then um, will this funding allow us to spend the money on um, like writing a check to the name of the tenant instead of the landlord? And of course, as long as the tenant is willing to cooperate and provide all the necessary documents, if possible, for example, filling out a W-9, or giving their IT or social security number and stuff? Under the SDG, so under the state funding, paying the assistant directly to the tenant or to the participant is not allowable. That is a set by the state law. We cannot pay assistant to the tenant. The assistant must go to the landlord. So that is one of the main um, SDG criteria guidelines. I think. Can can the landlord have a designee that can receive this check instead of directly to the landlord uh, instead of directly to the landlord themselves? Uh, could you repeat that? 
I say, can the landlord have a designee, somebody they can designate the check to be written to in lieu of themselves, just to kind of circumvent this problem? That's we need to we we need to uh, we need to seek guidance from the state. Again, the current guideline under SDG is the 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 money it, which is arrears, which is rent. Um, as a grantee, so as a stewards of this funds, we need to make sure this money is going to the correct person. And for the purpose of this project, that is the landlord, because the landlord is one who is kind of building the household for the rent and the household is not unable to pay it. So that un, not cannot pay amount is rent and we need to make sure the rent is going to the landlord. However, so, but if the landlord is actually designating someone else to receive the money on their behalf, that's, um, we may need to, we, we do need to seek commerce guidance on that. Because what happens is um, this could create many room for fraud because other people can take advantage of this because the money is not to the landlord. It's, it's like different names on the property um, and we have seen this happen in our community many times. So we um, so that that's the other thing. And especially for those bad people trying to take an advantage, they do take advantage of the people with no documents, you know, people with least amount of resources. So we do want to make sure all the funds are going to right community to right to the people who are actually in need. So that's why some of these regulations are in place for that. However, if they are bringing some barriers, we do need to discuss it with comp with the state, and probably need to review it case by case. Well, you see, that is exactly my point. I mean, and I believe that these discussions could have happened prior, because the state, um, the, the, this RFPs came out, the general population and youth population, um. Uh, RFPs came out, then this buy and for we've been anticipating it and looking forward to it. Uh, but honestly, it doesn't look like, in my opinion, that it's um, uh, the disparities still continue to exist. It's not solving the problems um, uh, to a great extent. Yes, it might be helpful, but there are still a lot of barriers, especially to those who, I mean, will need it. Like I said earlier, our situation and these other organizations or communities might be very similar. For example, if a woman is experiencing domestic violence and the husband brings her here, does not even file documents for her to be able to have an ID card or a social security number, and that woman wants to be independent to move out on her own, she would not be able to have an apartment or anything in her own name because there was no documentation for her to be able to do that, even if she wants it. it. Things are very complex and complicated. And these are some of the issues that we are dealing with on a regular basis. So somebody would be faced because they cannot get an apartment. They would rather continue to be in a DV situation for a very long time, because if they leave that environment, they would end up I mean, on the streets and they don't want it. Sometimes they have kids that they need to deal with and situations that are very extreme, dear, bitter, and unfortunate. We wish the system is able to like adjust and let go some of these um, barriers that are obstacles to our communities, or at least have these conversations in advance, seek our opinions and input if you really want to serve us, if you really want our communities to benefit from this funding and reach the I mean, uh, last person in the community these conversations need to happen in advance. You get our input and then use it to define the guidelines of the RFP. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Pa. I do appreciate it. Um, and this is definitely something that we need to talk with commerce about um, and point out the, the barriers and issues that you specifically pointed out. Um, as far as the way that the, the funding is and the requirements right now, um, we are going to do everything we can to work with you and work on things on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but 
when it comes to some of those other changes, those are things that we do need to talk with commerce about um, because there are some, you know, things that we do have to follow um, with that funding source. Um, and then I did want to point out that Andreas um, asked a question in the chat um, about whether or not the form that G was talking about before is similar to the RPA that landlords have to sign now to apply for ERAP and TRAP. It is, it, it's in the same line, but it's, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same. It is in the same line, but the requirements for the SDG will be different than current ERAP and TRAP. But it is, by having the landlord signing it, yes, it, it's the same. I have a question yeah. here. Sure. Actually, this is linked to what, what Pa said earlier. I think a um, uh, couple of minutes back, maybe one of the um, options would be probably to, for example, allow Wawa to lease units, apartment units on the Wawa, you know, in a, in a property and use it to house people that, that, um, that need housing. Um, to avoid people that are illegal or don't have the right documentation to sign uh, to sign any uh, any document in receipt of payment or anything else i think if you can implement or maybe this is not even you know prevented but if we can you um, use that option of having our own units um, then we do then we deal with the landlord directly we pay the landlords directly and have the uh, our community members house uh, use these apartments as housing uh -huh. How, how is that? That's something we also need to check with the state as well. Because that, again, this money is not the Snohomish County money. This funding is not Snohomish County. This is a state funding. So we need to, uh, if there's anything that's outside of the state guidance, we need to check with the state to see. Yeah, because if we don't, if we don't what is going to happen is that from all we've, we've been talking about, is what's going to happen is that the people that need this need the assistance will even get it because if they cannot sign receipt of payment and we cannot um, have units assigned to organizations to to house people that need housing if we cannot do any of this then we're going to eliminate a good chunk of the people that really needs it that really needs the support a, a bunch of most of the people that need this support are people within this category so if none of this is is acceptable there is still people that are going to benefit. Of, of course, there will be, but a good number of people who really are in their needs will not. Uh, if you will not use apartment units, or if you, if you, do, if you want to use other ways of having the, um, the land or something designate who is going to, who is uh, to whose the uh, to whom the checks are going to be um, written to, then it means, um, I mean, really, um, I mean, this is going to leave a lot of people behind. If you can give us uh, like a send email to us of the list of the items that you see it as a concern and as uh, how you see it, how you would like to recommend such as having a landlord designate uh, um, a receiver for the funds for those items. If you can email those lists to us, we will we will ask Commerce, we will ask the state if that's something that we can do in Snohomish County. Because so course, is it is it is it um correct then to say that in fact organizations would not be allowed to go lease apartment units and put community members in there for the period of the contract that's not allowed right for commerce guidelines for this funding is that the understanding the purpose of this funding is prevention it's eviction prevention and the household needs to already be a house they're already living in some place with a lease or they owe money to prevent it. So, so that, that's one part of it. Having an agency, having a property under the agency name, that puts a um, different conflict for the project. So that's why we need to ask the state. Right now, that is not allowable under SDG, but we need to ask the state to see if that is allowable. So, I mean, I stand to be corrected. Did I not hear you say earlier that relocation is an allowable, is an option? That relocation is an option? Relocation is an option, yes. 
So if relocation is an option and a community member is experiencing challenges from the landlord who is in fact asking them for money, so getting them to relocate to a unit, for example, that our organizations we have to take, that's not an option. I mean, I, I, if I was to consider relocation, I would consider that to be one option, but I stand to be corrected. So relocation is an option, but what you're asking is you would like your agency to like sign a lease with an apartment under your agency's name and have right. the household move in. Right. Is it, is it right? So we need to right. run with this. We need to run that by state to see if that's allowable. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because I think, this, <laughs> I, I think yeah. it's good to, it's, I think it's very good to, to know the answers to these questions as soon as possible because we are about to tender our our proposals, and if there is things that are obviously not going to pass the test, then it means those proposals have to be revised to satisfy the requirement. Because if you still don't know, we have like two weeks to, to tender applications, and there is very pertinent, very important question that we are asking today that's extremely important, and that 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 actually is the foundation of whether we can even pass the lead bus test. So these are answers we need to know as soon as possible. Yeah. So if you could email us what you see as a barrier for your community, we will raise this to the state. The other part of it is um, yes, this, this funding can assist very diverse households and their circumstances. So just because one area is not allowed, that does not mean you will have other members in your community. You, do, you, you can still serve the other groups. So even, I know the timing is, is like two, is it, when is it due? Is this two weeks left? I, I still strongly encourage you guys to apply for the RFP because that one, so even that one group of the population where the landlord is not wanting to participate, there still is one group, but there are others in your community that you can still assist with this fund. So I hope this is not a barrier or for you to hesitate to apply for this funding. Oh, and also, state as the state is operating because this is new for the state this is a brand new project for the washington state so the state is kind of like making the guidelines as we go so they may say it's not allowed right now but a couple months down the line they may revise it depending on the feedback that we see so i just want to let you know just because it's not allowed at this time it does not mean it will change later so I hope these are not hesitating you guys to apply. So I, we do strongly ask you to apply for the RFP. The other part about the state funding is state needs to apply the same rule to entire state of Washington, not just for Snohomish County. So if they are to allow something just for Snohomish County, it's something that state needs to review and discuss to see if that is allowable. That's why asking something very specific could take a little bit longer for state to say yes or no, because this is a statewide funding. Well, I cannot reiterate enough the importance of uh, state commerce and the county to really engage us. If you want us and our communities to benefit from these fundings extensively to engage us and get our inputs to use that to define um, the guidelines as long as they are within the confines of the law. If not, this doesn't look like it was designed based on, I mean, at least for my community, for our greater problems, issues, and challenges we have with housing. And I want to reiterate that, I mean, feedback a lot for the last time. Thank you, thank you. Yes, and it is really important feedback. Um, and like she has said, um, please send me emails with what barriers you see with this funding right now. Um, and we can bring those up with commerce and hopefully get answers to you as quickly as possible. Ruby, did you have a question? Yes, I did. I'm just waiting my turn. Um, my question is, um, we have a lot of clients that jump from county to county, a lot of originated in Snohomish County, but actually come down to wanting service. 
they're a different county, say for instance, King County or Spokane County or Ferry County, are you still able to use that fund for individuals that might have been in Snohomish but are no longer in Snohomish, but they're on your client base? What happens is this is based on, since they need to have a arrears, so the address needs to be in Snohomish County. Okay. So it's so specifically it's a Snohomish County resident. Yes. They must face um, housing hardship, I guess, housing instability in Snohomish County. So the address they reside, where they are facing instability, which is they are unable to pay rent, needs to be in Snohomish County. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. All right. Are there additional Wait. questions? I, I, I have a question on um, uh, in the RFP. I think there's in, in one of the questions, there's a question that talked about 80% of, of, I think, pe of, of people who benefited from this, who will benefit from this grant, should be able to have permanent housing within six months of exit of the program. Is that correct? That is correct. Can you, can, yes. you explain that? can you explain that in detail, please? Yes. So um, performance measures are something that uh, we utilize for our funding to make sure that um, clients are being served and that the, the project is successful. Um, with this RFP, with this, this application and this funding, Commerce doesn't have any performance guidelines right now. Um, Commerce is basically, since this is brand new, is kind of seeing how it goes and then maybe adding some performance um, uh, measures later. So what we did is we took um, one of the hearth measures, which is for Snohomish County specifically, and um, we added that as one of the performance measures to track. So the idea is that um, maybe a quarterly report would be sent to us to let us know, you know, with the people who you have served with this funds, um, whether or not they have remained in, you know, secure housing for six months after they were served. Um, Sam and I were talking about it and talking about how that might be difficult to track. And so that is something that we've talked about maybe adjusting. We might see how it goes and talk to the, organ the organizations that are awarded the funding, come up with a plan to figure out how that would work um, and whether or not it's realistic. Um, it is a possibility that that performance measure might change, um, that as we move further along, we might get direction from commerce and it also um, might just, it might come across as being more difficult to track. So um, it's what we're starting with for now, um, but it's not necessarily something that we're going to stick with, um, but it is something that we would like organizations to think about, which is um, how do you know that the services that you provide have supported that individual or family in remaining securely housed. So it's just trying to track um, the outcomes in a way that might be realistic. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And I think uh, it does. And it also make it, makes it a little kind of uncertainty because we are writing the grant as we speak. And some of us might even submit ours next week. So the fact that we don't even know what, what we're going to be sticking with in terms of that 80% of beneficiaries being able, to be able, being able to have the six months of housing, since, we, since we're not even sure whether we're going to tweak that or not, I'm trying to wonder what should we reflect in our proposal. Should, it be, should we write in general terms or should we, write in, should, we, should we write it in terms of our own recommendations? Because if we answer the question the way it is framed, and which is not like you said, which is difficult to kind of address, and it changes three weeks after we submit the proposals. 
I don't know how that affects the whole process. So I would I would recommend um, trying to uh, answer the question now and assume that that's going to be the measurement for you know at least the next three to six months, um, and then we might you know make changes in the future. But um, you could also look at it as a way to kind of help yourself think about how you're going to track the outcome of this program. Um, and so you can think of uh, that in kind of a more broader broader sense if you would like. Um, but that measurement is going to be a measurement that when we work together to create the contracts, we will be figuring out a way for you to report that information and and to you know collect that information. Okay. Yeah. Because because I think I think one of the difficulties might be the people you support six months after or even longer after that, you might not even be able to track them down. Maybe people have moved to other areas or something has happened. So I, mean, I, I, I agree completely with all what you said. And we need to consider that too, that you may not be able to even track down the same people and talk to them six months after the time we have we have defined that they should be 80% be able to have their own housing. So that might be a challenge. But yeah, I, uh, you know, I got you and we will write it um, just around those times. Thank you. Yes, and, and you won't be um, penalized in any way if you're unable to connect to and reach out to those people six months after you've served them. Like, if, if you're not able to reach them, then there there will be no penalty for your organization. That's not that's not why we're doing it. It's more of just tracking outcomes. Okay. Well, thank you. Tom. No, I have asked this question before. I just want to reiterate and confirm. I think when we met last week, I asked, um, what's the maximum per organization? I know it's about 1.1 million overall, but what's the maximum that an organization can apply for? Has there been any change? Um, I think you said there wasn't any, but I just want to confirm, what's the maximum amount that an organization can apply for? Yes. Correct. Um, there hasn't been any change. Uh, an organization can apply for the full amount, the $1,142,000, but the intention of this program is to fund multiple organizations. So if you did apply for the full amount, you most likely would not be awarded the full amount if your organization was chosen to be awarded. Um, you would most likely be awarded less than the full amount so that multiple organizations could be awarded. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Lastly, all expenses only related to housing, or would there be uh, uh, other expenses um, or other needs, such as utilities and other stuff allowed to be paid for this from this fund, or is it exclusively just rent? No, it's a it's, uh, good question. It's also utilities. So um, utilities, uh, past utilities, and then um, cost for relocation would also be included, like G had said before. So that's like application fee, uh, first, last, safety deposit, whatever is required to move into a new place. All right, I think we're good, Tom. Regarding the, the metric that we were talking about, the reporting metric, um, I would encourage you to rethink that, at least from the scope standpoint, because, um, you know, regardless of the contact activities and how hard that is, you know, reporting in post period for things six months after the grants ended generally involves hours of people to do after the grant is over. So I would, however you do re reporting, I would encourage you to try to encapsulate it within the period that's paid for. Because like, you know, in, you know, what I don't want to be doing is making reports six months after, you know, if, if the last month we gave somebody rent assistance was in, you know, March of 2024, I, I don't want to be figuring out how to pay to report for that in September of 2024 after the grants already ended. So as much as possible, if the metrics could flow within the periods, you know, um, that, that, that makes it a lot easier on us, you know, because they're, 
I don't want to jump into a, a commitment for activities that I don't know who is and isn't going to be paid to do the work at the period in time. That was all. Thank you. That's a very good point. And um, yes, regardless of how the metrics end up changing or not moving forward, we would not ask any work to be done after the closing of the grant. of the grant. So um, thank you for pointing that out. That is definitely something that we will keep in mind. Okay. You know, because as you as you look at efficacy, you know, if we're trying to go back six months after we get six months into the program, everybody that starts past that point isn't going to fall into a six month window. So I think the, the six months is kind of where I was getting kind of weird with it. But um, anyway, we'll, we'll work it out. I, I, I just have a little thing to throw onto that. And I think just to talk about the reporting process. And I think um, whatever his name is, I, I don't know, I didn't catch your name. But I, I have I have almost, I think I have gone through all the lines of this uh, RFP. I think I read through all of it, if, if you will. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I think yes. I haven't seen anything specifically what they require re reporting variables. What, what are we going to be reporting on? Um, I think it's good to know it now. So that as we design the the proposal, we can include our having monitor and evaluate the, uh, the those targets that we are looking to to satisfy at the end of the at the end or during the reporting period. So I haven't seen anything that tells us that when we report, we're going to be reporting on A, B, or C. And I think that should have been very good to have um, in the RFP so that we know what we, will, what we locally call, what we're getting into. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Um, I was actually working on that with Sam today. Um, so as far as reporting requirements are concerned, um, Invoicing is going to be something that you'll be putting together and you'll be sending to the county. With the invoices, we are asking for backup documentation, which means um, general ledger, source documentation, like receipts or costs, um, uh, timesheets. And then as we've talked about um, before, there's also going to be requirements that um, information is going to have to be entered into HMIS, um, the Homeless uh, Management Information System. Mm -hmm. um, and then there will most likely be um, some kind of reporting, like I said, quarterly for the performance um, outcomes. So that 80% for six months that we were talking about before, that would be something that you would report to us. Um, Sam and I talked about today, like on a quarterly basis. Um, and then organizations are going to have to keep the um, documentation that you use to decide whether or not clients are eligible for the funding. So those documentations um, will have to be at your organization and then as county staff we will be monitoring at some point and so we'll we'll check um, that those client files mm -hmm. so that is something during the contracting period that i will go over um, client files with everyone kind of walk you through what needs to be in a client file what pieces of information need to be there um, also, under the SDG funding, because it's the state funding, state there are requirements from the state where when state comes to monitor the county, they will look for. And as a county, we need to make sure all the client files have everything the state required. State has mm -hmm. for. And there are a list of things state requires, and they're actually forms. State made the forms. Um, to do that, and one of them is part of part of it is the eligibility requirement, eligibility to meet the SDG prevention forms. All those are already being set by the state, and so we will need to take state's form and utilize it within the county because that's set by the state. And so those forms will be required for each uh, client files as well. So uh, are these available only after the contract is signed or can we have them 
beforehand so that we just we you know so 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 that we just know. I, I, I mean, I mean everything with everything regarding reporting. Is it going to be given after we sign the contract, or I mean, the best practice best practice would have been to have it now before even going to contracting, so that we know what this whole thing is about. One thing we can do is we can share you uh, the commerce site. Commerce has a web page for SDG, and they post their forms there. We can send you the link to that, so you can see what kind of forms. However, just want to let you know, under SDG, there are a lot of projects and commerce do not parse out like this is only for prevention or this is only for hand. They don't do that. They just have one page for SDG and they put all their forms and their checklists on there. And the other thing is once um, we start utilizing, there's some parts in the form that that's when we will reach out to commerce and say, could we make some adjustments? Did, the form asks for X, Y, and Z. Could we do something else for our community? So we will, um, based on your needs, that's something that we will ask Commerce for any adjustments. But what's on their website is more of a general use for the entire state. But we can definitely send you the link so you can see what kind of forms the state has put it on the web page. And as a county, we don't ask um, forms or something just for the county. We usually we go by what state only requires us. Okay, and thank you. Why we wanted to send you the link is commerce updates those. So if, if we were to send you the like the form as a PDF, if commerce updates it, then you won't get to see the update. So that's why we want to send you the link. So as soon as commerce updates it, you guys are informed as well. Okay, we can we um, we can we can wait we can wait till contracting if that's if that's uh, if that's best practice to do that's okay. Well, and I can I'll send an email out with the link mm -hmm. to the commerce forms and a little bit of direction as to maybe what forms would qualify for the prevention services. So that one we're still reviewing as well. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's for us. This is new for us as well because it's a brand new funding for the state, brand new funding for the county. So we are also kind of learning as we go along as well on the forms and the requirements by the state. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why we, we say anything different, anything um, different that we are requesting, we need to ask the state. It's okay. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. just kind of had a general comment as you started talking about contracting. As you approach that process, I would encourage the, the state, the county to um, look at the insurance sections. I notice what I see a lot of times is also often way out of scope for small neighborhood agencies. I see requests for things like data integrity insurance and um, pushing E&O insurance and things like that. And, um, you know, I, I just want to make sure that as we go into this, you know, the scope of the project fits the request of the overhead that's required, you know, the, the infrastructure required. So if they, you know, if they look at it from the standpoint of they're not contracting with Boeing, they're contracting with a little agency, we don't, you know, we don't have some of the same things. And I notice sometimes they'll get in their blanket templates a lot of things that are um, barriers for small organizations, people that aren't doing millions and millions of dollars a year. So I would just ask you to be, you know, considerate of that as you look at the contracts that you're going to produce, um, you know, what's actually being asked of us to have and maintain in order to prescribe the contract. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Some um, parts of our contracts are already set and that's, that's not us. It's already set by the county and it's been reviewed and approved by the um, district uh, attorney general and, the, and the, the lawyers in that part. So yes, thank you for that. We will need to think about, because as a county, this will be a brand new contract with a brand new agency, with a brand new group. So they are, it's not just contract for just one project, it's actually contracting with the agency and then contracting with the, um, project together. So there are other pieces to the contract. You're right. 
Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with that. Just, you know, as you're trying to move to buy and for agreement, part of the reason it was done the way it was done initially is because they can, the people that were administering the funds, regardless of the dollars that didn't make it to the street as a result of the process, they were the ones who had the insurance and the documentation and the audits and a lot of these other things that, um, you know, small agencies aren't often prepared to deal with. So just kind of a heads up as we get into that, if you can look at it from, you know, look at the contract for, an, for with an eye to smaller organizations, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you that goes into our basic terms and conditions. Yes. The EPA, the EAA, with the uh, agency. So that will require um, a different level of review. Any questions on the budget, draft the budget? So I did want to share something. Um, if no one has any questions right now about the budget. Because the Washington West African Center um, asked a really great question last week um, about uh, the audit, um, the audited financial statements. And we found out um, that there are additional documents that you can have in place of um, the audited financial um, documents. So if you have not had an audit because of you know, your agency being smaller and not needing a financial audit, then you can in place send financial statements, um, IRS form 990 or financial review engagement documents. Um, basically anything that will help us staff to see um, uh, that you can successfully, you know, spend out the funds of this grant. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, that that is something that is not currently on the RFP because it was an answer that we just, um, uh, we just figured out this week. So does anyone have any questions about that um, or about what other documents would qualify? Oh. Hello. Oh, I just said no, no. <laughs> oh, you said no. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I thought, I thought you had a question. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. Natasha, okay. I have a question. This is JJ. Oh, hi, JJ. Hey, so uh, let's say this is the newly formed organization. What other documents will suffice? Um, ooh, that's a very good question. Um, do you have any ideas? Would you audit? Mm -hmm, mm. In place of the audit? Mm. No, we will have to look. If they're new, do you, yeah, if they're new since they would not have any so since you're new you would not have any previous audits is, is that where you're going that is correct yes okay okay with that one um we will check and we'll let you know uh -huh. there's something that we probably need to check as a county and also with the state as well on how what they see as a guideline under SRD. Right. i appreciate it thank you thank you Yeah, that's a good question. All right, and then I am going to go back a little bit. Um, this is something that I shared in our last um, application workshop where we talked about the narrative portion of the application. And I just wanted to reiterate that for applications for this funding, there are four threshold criteria that need to be met in order for the application to be considered for funding. So I just want to reiterate that the application has to be submitted on time, um, which is by June 6th at 4 p.m. Um, the best way to turn in the application is electronically via email. You can also um, mail it in or you can hand deliver 
Um, we highly recommend um, turning in electronically if you can. Um, the second threshold criteria is to make sure that the application is complete. So all the required materials are there. Um, and that was the slide that I was just on before, which was some of the supplemental required materials. Um, that information is in the RFP, so please make sure to look at those required materials and send in uh, whatever materials are required for your organization for this project. The third threshold criteria is just that the project is eligible for this RFP. So that means that it's homelessness prevention services, um, which are rent payments, arrears, utility payments, and then um, cost for relocation. Um, and like G had mentioned earlier too, it's for within Snohomish County. So um, the fourth part of this threshold criteria is that your organization is considered a buy-in for organization as per the commerce definition. Um, and that is one of the, I think it's the second question of the narrative portion of the application. So just make sure to um, explain the ways in which you feel that your organization can be considered by and for. Um, and then I think I just wanted to go through um, the application timeline and just point out that um, next Friday, June 2nd, is the last um, time that you can request technical assistance. So if you have any further questions, please email me um, and we can set up a time to talk one on one or we can uh, do question and answer via email. Um, the recording of this will be on the website in the next couple of business days. The slides should be uploaded tomorrow sometime. Um, and then the application is due on Tuesday, June 6th. The review process will take place in June and we're hoping that um, with the project review committee, we can get things scheduled and organized so that we can notify applicants about funding awards um, late June or early July, and then start working on contracts. And these contracts will begin on August 1st. All right, any questions? Does anyone have any questions? I'm gonna stop sharing again. All right, well, thank you so much for being here and for asking all those questions. Um, I really appreciate those questions and uh, I really want to make sure that we create a program and funding that works for your organizations. So we're gonna keep going back to commerce and telling them about the barriers and requesting adjustments and changes. Um, so thank you. Thank you for all the important work that you do. We really appreciate it. I'm going to stop the recording.